So here we are. Uh, guess what the theme of, of today's meeting is, oh, folks? I don't have mine on. Oh, we got to, we all got to get, oh, and we've got to talk about this glasses situation, people. Yes. I yes. mean, let's, let's talk about this. So first of all, everybody, welcome to Let's Talk Coronavirus. LTC. I'm Rachel Bergstrom. And I'm, I'm fastening ahead. my mask, sorry. And with me is... I'm Ron Watson. I'm right here. I'm here with you. And today our special guest is Britt Scharinghausen from the hey. Department of Physics and Astronomy. Yeah. She's coming to us live from the space station. <laughs> we're, we're socially distant up here. Oh, yes. There you go. Um, there you go. All right. All right. Well, welcome to Let's Talk Coronavirus, everybody. Uh, today, we're clearly going to be talking about masks. And as we are all social distancing currently in our own houses, I'm in my basement, full disclosure. Mm -hmm. um, we will be removing our masks uh, in a bit, but I did want us to have some time to talk with our masks on. Right. So, well, it takes, it's hard to breathe in these, isn't it? Yeah, if you're claustrophobic, you know, wearing the mask, I mean, that's a, that's maybe one aspect of this we can talk about a little bit, right, is, you know, how much of the resistance to wearing masks is really about people who have some sort of low key or moderate uh, claustrophobia, right? Mm -hmm. so. Affects people with asthma as well. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. There's that too. So, um, but yeah, I mean, this is this is an episode that's obviously has been a long time coming, but it's an important one uh, for so many reasons, uh, including some of the first quote unquote guidance that was coming out from both the World Health Organization and the CDC that seemed to say, you know, wearing masks is pointless. Don't wear masks. Mm -hmm. And and we saw obviously an about face on that um, over the last few months. But yeah. um, I so started off a mask, uh, a mask refuser yeah uh, and too. then i had to turn around yeah and that's well, i mean that i think that's that's a that's a fairly common uh position now right mm -hmm. um and so we can we wanted to talk a little bit today about that and uh brit was so gracious to come in and in fact i'm wearing a brit special here right mm -hmm. so uh brit first of all thank you again for preparing this for me uh but this is this mask it's also reversible it's very stylish obviously reusable right so mm -hmm. Um, uh, excellent mask. And maybe, uh, Rachel, if you're okay with it and you too, Britt, maybe we start off by talking about why cloth? Sure, sure. Um, well, I think that one of the first places to start is I did cloth because the CDC suggested it. Okay. Great. What about you? Yeah, um, I like I said at, at the beginning, I was I was anti-mask um, for some of the reasons that were cited by the CDC and the WHO, um, which is um, people who are not used to wearing masks, wearing masks, maybe wearing masks that aren't fitted all that well, mm -hmm. might um, touch their face more, mm -hmm. um, and might wear the masks improperly and just sort of follow improper hygiene with them. So if you imagine the mask can do, I don't want to get ahead of you on the science there, Ron and Rachel, but mm -hmm. um, the mask can serve two purposes. It stops, if you have the virus, it stops it from getting out and infecting other people. And for a basic cloth mask like this, that's the primary purpose. Um, and then perhaps a little bit, if you encounter someone who has the virus, it might stop the virus from getting in. But imagine if um, you have the virus, and you're trying to avoid giving it to other people, but your mask is uncomfortable. So yep. you're scooching it around and pulling it down and pulling it back up. You're going to end up, you know, scratching underneath it. You know, we've all seen some of this behavior out in public and going like, ah. um, <laughs> you know, uh, that now you got the, you've got the virus on your hands and now you can spread it around. Um, similarly, if your goal is to avoid, you know, bringing the virus in um, and you um, touch your mask, uh, then, you know, if there are any viral virus, if there's virus on the mask, then you pick it up on. Your um, if you handle it badly, you know, like if you're, walk in, uh, leave your public place and you do one of these numbers. 
Okay. Um, now, if you have the virus, this is all full of virus, right? Mm -hmm. um, and if you touch this, now you've got it on your hands. Mm -hmm. um, if you, um, you know, if you take it off and you're talking to people and waving it around, <laughs> if, you, if you if you put it back on, um, and the person who made your mask uh, didn't make it double sided, and you don't realize which ones inside and outside, then whatever you were trying to accomplish, you've now done exactly the opposite if you put it back on and it's backwards from the way you were wearing it before. Right. So, so you can see some of these ways that wearing masks might um, contribute to the spread of coronavirus, especially if it's done improperly. And I think those were the main concerns that were raised before. Sure. So um, I, before, yeah. before we go on, I just want to point out that uh, we are monitoring the comments in Facebook right now. And so if yeah. you have questions about mask wearing, or about anything we're talking about, or just want to comment, we'd love to hear from you. You can add those to the comments in Facebook. So I think, oh, I'm going to have to take mine off because it yeah, is it's pretty hard, hard. Yeah. It's hard distant, to really though. talk. And so before I do this, I just wanted to say, we're going to talk about some practical things like this. Oh, now it's not doing it. Uh, you mean like how the reason why I had to take mine off? Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. We're going to yeah. talk about some practical considerations for wearing masks with glasses because there's been a lot on, um, well, I listen to a lot of NPR. And so there's been a lot on NPR about how you can actually um, prevent glasses from fogging up. But Cover. let's go back to kind of this difference between a cloth mask mm -hmm. and some of the masks that are being used in like healthcare settings. Mm -hmm. One of the most popular masks um, and that many of you have probably heard about is the N95 respirator. And so um, there's also, of course, this little situation here, which mm -hmm. will We'll get we'll get uh, to in a bit, <laughs> um, but uh, the N95 uh, is an interesting mask, and um, it's a molded mask that, unlike our fabric masks, um, is really 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 fitted to your face. And so, mm -hmm. um, with our fabric masks, when we had them up and we were breathing, we had some condensation up on our glasses because it wasn't a perfectly tight fit. I also get, you know, a little bit of, do you guys get a little bit out the sides and out yeah. the, the bottom? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, uh, the N95 though is not a woven material. And so, um, it's actually a whole bunch of polymers that are just kind of like glued together and put together in a way that makes the fabric um, uh, have very, very, very small holes in it. Um, and so that's, a, that's one very big difference between the fabric coverings and the N95 respirators. And so Britt um, and Ron, uh, what do you do about your masks after you've worn them when you're wearing your fabric masks? Yeah, so ideally oh, you take it off. On your muted, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, <laughs> you take it off using the strings only. Um, don't touch the mask itself. Um, put it into a closed container. And then the great thing about the Rona is that it is destroyed by soap and water. So I just wash it along with, I throw it in with kitchen towels or sheets or whatever, you know, whatever I'm putting in the wash that week. Yep. Ron, what do you do with yours? Yeah. Well, you know, the perfectly honest, I haven't actually had the opportunity to use it a whole lot yet. Right? <laughs> so I'm sort of, you know, I guess after this, I'll be putting it in the wash as well, right? So, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, that's the plan with a cloth mask because at least it's, it is absolutely reusable, right? Right. right. So, yep. so, and, and, I did a little bit of digging around. So my history or my, my training has been in biomedical sciences and in biomedical sciences, we deal with a lot of bacteria and viruses and stuff. And so one of the things that I've been interested in is, is an autoclave, which is usually what we use for, um, for killing bacteria. But I, I was thinking about it and I was thinking, well, there's probably going to be, you know, bacteria on there too. And so I want it to be really, really clean. And I found a paper in PLOS One nice. ab about using your Instant Pot mm -hmm. as an autoclave. And so what an autoclave is, is it gets the temperature really high and it mm -hmm. adds pressure and that kills bacteria. Yeah. And so, 
<laughs> and so there's they they did a study it was it was looking for uh autoclave alternatives for um schools like beloit or or high schools that mm -hmm. they want to have sterilized growth media for bacteria mm -hmm. um and so we actually take ours and we throw them through the through the instant pot nice. too very nice. Yeah, I've done that a few times when I had just a few masks that I wanted to ship out to people and I didn't want to run a whole load of laundry. It's probably easier on water, you know, our water use that way. Yeah. Well, yeah. another thing that that's actually a really good idea, and, and I know this as a cloth diaper user too, mm -hmm. um, but also from my microbiology experience, is that UV light actually has sterilizing properties. Mm -hmm. um, we might have heard this from a certain president of the United States about the potential for using that to treat coronavirus. Here's the deal. You cannot use UV light to treat coronavirus infections, but UV light is used routinely to sterilize surfaces. And so uh, a mask, after it's been washed, if you put it out into the sun and let it dry in the sun, it's gonna get that UV light on it and it's going to help to uh, sterilize it and kill the virus. And so in that respect, we can actually use the, the UV light to our benefit. Yeah. Um, so uh, we have a question from Facebook. Um, we have somebody says, I have a family member who has claustrophobia. Wearing a mask is rough. What do you suggest for them if they go out in public? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that this is really a, a really serious question, right? Um, I'm not claustrophobic. And even I sometimes, again, you know, I feel myself going, Whew, man, this is kind of a, a thing, right? So I can imagine what it can cause. Um, I guess the, the question I would ask is, uh, one, does the person have to go out in public, right? And then if they do, is the, is the experience triggered by having like this full face thing? Or can they maybe, uh, are they okay with having like a bandana or something, right? Mm -hmm. Which is, uh, you know, quite obvious, obviously a little bit, it's not quite the same level of protection, but is a great deal more um, protection, at least in, particularly in preventing you from spreading it um, if you have it. Uh, than not. So, I mean, I, in terms of options, you don't really have a whole lot of good options there, unfortunately, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that's what I would ask first is, you know, are they comfortable enough having something that hangs down so they can still sort of feel air here, right? Um, and I, I think, don't know what think, yeah. Yeah, that points out one of the big trade-offs with masks. Um, if you imagine having lots and lots of layers, obviously that's going to give you more protection, right? Mm -hmm. And the tighter the weave on the layers, um, the more protection you're going to get. So that's why all of mine are backed with old high thread count sheets, mm -hmm. um, thrifty and uh, virus stopping. Um, but, um, you know, it may be that if you're someone with claustrophobia or with maybe asthma or other breathing difficulties, mm -hmm. um, what could work for you would be something that's a little bit less... Um, uh, stifling. Um, and maybe it doesn't offer as much protection, but like Ron says, it's better than nothing. Um, mm -hmm. So you could uh, try a bandana or you could try, hit up your local friendly mask maker and ask if they could make you something that's maybe a little bit um, more breathable. Mm -hmm. I, I think that there's also a really important thing to, to note here is that masks are not the be all and end all of breaking the chain of infections um, in uh, COVID or in any other situation where there is um, airborne or droplet uh, borne uh, uh, transmission of diseases like COVID. Um, and so when we're thinking about what the CDC um, is recommending about um, mask usage, it's not use a mask and everything's going to be fine. It's a uh, mask. I, I've actually got it up here on my other screen, so I'm going to read it to you. Yeah, go for um, it. CDC recommends wearing face, sorry, cloth face coverings in public settings where other social distancing measures are difficult to maintain, for example, grocery stores and pharmacies, especially in areas of significant community-based transmission. And so it's, it's meant to be used in combination or as kind of like a backup to mm -hmm. social distancing. Yeah. Um, and given that um, many people are wearing the uh, cloth face coverings, the masks so when they're going grocery shopping, um, I, I mean, I haven't done very much grocery shopping. I have a, a, a spouse who has been taking good care of us and doing all the grocery shopping, but 
um, the the times that I've been out, it's it's been really hard to maintain that social distance. And so, yeah. um, I think another thing to think about is is um, how can you how can you decrease your interactions um, the the likelihood of interactions um, within that bubble of six feet. And so, what are some thoughts that you have about that, Ron and Britt? Um, Britt, go ahead. You can. I mean, I have some ideas about it. Go ahead. Um, I just, um, when I send out masks, I send a little fact sheet along with them. I didn't send one to Ron because I figured he, he already knows the score. Um, but, you know, with some of those recommendations and the number one thing that's on there is this mask is not going to protect you from coronavirus. It's not going to stop you from transmitting coronavirus. You still need to follow social distancing guidelines. So, and that's what I try to do when I'm out in, in public. I figure the mask helps, but it's not, um, it's not an excuse to not maintain a six foot distance as much as possible. Yeah, I mean, I think my own advice there, and it sort of ties back to our, our uh, question, right? Is, yeah, okay, you know, worst case scenario, worst case scenario, you don't wear a mask, right? Mm -hmm. um, and in that case, you have to make sure that you are really, really astringent when it comes to your social distancing and everything else. You know, but the problem increasingly is, um, at least over the past few weeks, um, prior to the, the quote unquote reopening of things, right? The, the problem really has been, you know, an increasing number of folks are in uh, places that are like, you know, no face covering, no service, right? Um, and so, I mean, I think one of the, for me, again, I don't suffer from, from terrible claustrophobia or anything, but my, uh, probably my go-to with that would be like, okay, don't wear the mask until I get there. Right. And then when I get there, I get out in my car or whatever, then I'll put the mask on or the bandana on, you know, go in, handle my business, go through socially distance and then just be done. Right. But, you know, again, I think we are we are limited necessarily in what we can do. But you're right. Social distancing is is still part of the equation and hand washing is still part of the equation. Yeah. And we have a suggestion in the, the comments on Facebook as well that um, perhaps having larger, so on the sides of the masks that I've got and on the ones that Britt and Ron are wearing, um, there's uh, pleats. Um, I've also seen, for example, my sister has made a more fitted uh, mask that kind of comes up and, and around over the nose, comes up around the ears. Um, these have a little bit more of a, a pocket in them for your face. Um, I notice it, um, it less when I'm not talking, but, um, or sorry, I notice that pocket more when I'm not talking. When I am talking, I feel like it's kind of like a, <gasps> you can see it going in there. <laughs> um, but, but so uh, trying a bunch of different mask styles is possible. I really think that Ron's suggestion too, to, to just try the bandana, tuck the bandana into your shirt mm -hmm. um, is, is another good possibility too, because it, it's kind of keeping that in there. And, and, and what is that that we're keeping in? Droplets. <laughs> droplets. Those darn droplets. Yeah. So, uh, Britt and Ron, do you know the difference between um, do you know the difference between aerosol and droplet uh, spread of diseases? Aerosol versus droplet. Uh, I mean, for me, aerosol is about really, really, really small droplets. <laughs> All right, but, yes. But, but um, and drop is obviously bigger. But uh, but do regale us on the differences here. <laughs> there's a there's a difference in your you're right Ron it really comes down to the size of of particles and the size of liquid that's coming out and so I've been I I do a lot of running I listen to a lot of NPR and podcasts on my runs so um you know I've got a lot of this but there was a uh, one particular uh discussion uh, or uh podcast and I'm trying to remember which one it is but they were talking about your mouth rain mm. um and <laughs> <laughs> droplets are mouth rain. Um, and <laughs> the way that I talk about it when I'm teaching this in emerging diseases is, you know, you've got your students who are in the front of the class and then you got your students who are in the back of the class, right? right? And so I talk about how the students in the front of the class, I apologize, but sometimes are going to wind up with spit, right? Yeah, because that's right. It's the we all do this. We've all done this, right? We've all found ourselves where we're like talking in class and then you're drooling down your face and you're realizing that. It's the excitement, it's the excitement of the work. This is what does it. 
<laughs> yeah. So droplets are these larger pieces, bits of, of spit mm -hmm. um, and snot that come out while you're talking. And we all do it, mm -hmm. right? Of course. Um, and there are some people who do it more, some people who do it less. But the thing about these droplets is that they're large and they're heavy. Mm -hmm. And so they fall to the ground. And that's kind of where we get this idea of three to six feet. There's there's some additional science that went into that, but um, three. The, that's the aerodynamic drag working for you there. <laughs> yes, <laughs> physics at work. It's, as it launches out of your face, aerodynamic <laughs> drag slows it down, and and then it inevitably hits the floor. <laughs> yes. So, so my computer is probably all covered in spit too. What do you mean, probably? <laughs> okay, so like I gotta wipe mine down after every one of these sessions. I know, and I get yelly in these too. <laughs> yelly, so true, true. Um, anyhow, so so we we when we're louder, we're doing more mouth rain, okay, mm. and when we're quieter, we're doing less mouth rain, right? Mm. Um, so that's kind of what the droplets are. So there's a number of different diseases that we know are transmitted primarily through droplets, and so that's going to include coronavirus. Um, and that's going to include influenza. Um, so <clears throat> this is this is all well and good. And there's there's some additional things that matter that I'll come to in a minute. Um, but the other the other way that we have like respiratory diseases transmitted is through aerosols. Mm -hmm. And aerosols are very, 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 very small particles of of water. And so this these interact differently with the drag, Brit, don't they? That's right. They experience linear yeah. drag rather than quadratic drag. So mm -hmm. they don't get slowed down nearly as quickly. Because they're so tiny? Yep. It's a size difference. Oh my gosh. That's beautiful. I'm so looking forward to teaching this in Physics 101 this fall. Right on. Excellent. That's, that's amazing. Okay. So the aerosols, because they're undergoing linear and not quadratic drag. We learned something. We literally <laughs> learned something right there. This is wonderful. I'm incorporating this into emerging diseases in the future, Britt. Maybe right. my 101 students can uh, can make a little more. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Make oh my gosh. Video. Yeah. Yes. Brilliant. Awesome. So the problem with aerosols is that they remain kind of like aloft in the air yes. for a much longer time. And so what this means is that um, there's a higher likelihood of somebody breathing it in because it's up in the air longer. Mm. And so diseases that are transmitted by this mechanism include tuberculosis and one of the most um, contagious diseases that we have, measles. Measles, woo woo. Yeah. Mm. And so measles, <laughs> for example. Never seen go hard for measles, but it's okay. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Transmissibility champion. <laughs> Definitely wins the transmissibility award. That's for sure. Oh my gosh, it really does. It's so, incredible. and and so if we think about measles, um, if I were to come into this room with my plague doctor here, and I had measles, I would be breathing out measles virus. Okay, and I'd be breathing it in these aerosols, and they would uh, undergo their linear drag, and they would be aloft in the air. And then Ron came into my basement and breathed within the next two hours, mm. he would be exposed to measles. Yeah, that's right. And if he had, wasn't immune, um, he there's a really, really high likelihood that he would wind up coming down with measles. Yeah. So one of the questions that's been kind of going around is um, about COVID-19 is it's airborne. Yeah. Okay. And so, what we know about COVID-19 is that it really is primarily droplet spread. And just because we, we have this, this kind of average of about six feet, that droplets kind of don't make it much further than that, doesn't mean that droplets can't make it much further than that. You know, because it's an uh, average, right? I mean, at the yeah, end of the day. Yeah, so like my toddler, I don't know if, if your toddler does this too, Ron, but <laughs> right? <laughs> Yes, yes. This we can't take her out in public right now because no, no, no. <laughs> but that's gonna send in my spit, my mouth rain much, much mm. further. Um so another issue is that if we all know that um influenza has a seasonality to it, right? We're familiar with that. Mm -hmm. Do you do you remember what the months are that we need to be concerned about that? 
Oh my God, no, I do not. Um, but I mean, I seem to remember usually every time in September, October or around that time, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's a winter disease, right? We think about it as a winter disease. And so there's a few different reasons why we think of influenza as a winter disease. And this is one of the things that we're thinking about for uh, COVID-19 moving forward as well. Um, uh, in the winter, we're all inside and it's dry. And so one of the things that happens with droplets for spreading influenza when it's dry out is those droplets, the mouth rain comes out and because the air is so dry, it like sucks all of the, it like evaporates, evaporates all of the water of the droplet and leaves a much, much, much smaller uh, bit of virus in some moisture. And what does that sound like? That sounds like an aerosol, right? And so it winds up being, it's not, we don't consider it aerosolized. Well, I guess it becomes a little bit aerosolized. I'm gonna have to look that up. But it becomes, it's able to um, remain in the air a lot longer through physics. <laughs> so they, that's, this is why folks, this is why you learn physics and biology. That's right. And this is, this is the reason why. This um, is the payoff. This is the, <laughs> the, the an internet show is the, is the payoff. <laughs> Um, so we've got a couple of questions here um, in the in the chat. Um, so let me just read one here. So let's see. Someone oh, I, says, "I just put up uh, the same one." Um, yeah, uh, all good. Hoping that students return in the fall. Is Beloit planning to educate students on the proper use of PPE slash masks, personal hygiene slash hand washing, disinfecting, social distancing, per the CDC guidelines at at that time? Thanks. Um, I mean, I feel fairly comfortable saying yes. I mean, we have um, uh, two, basically two different committees working on what, what it will look like for us to come back here in the fall and for students to be back on campus. Um, one focused specifically on COVID and the other, of course, you know, on the sort of emergency situation. So um, I would say absolutely yes. Um, I have some insight, insight and inside information into one of those uh, committees for sure. So definitely that is the case. Um, I think the broader question is, to what extent can we be successful doing that? Um, and to what extent can we get buy-in from all of the students uh, who are on campus? And one of the things that I'm confident about, uh, and I've said this to any number of folks, is that uh, we, first of all, we have a student body that is very conscientious. In, I mean, generally speaking, right? But you know, everyone everyone can slip up, right? No matter no matter who you are. Um, but we also have a, a small campus, and this is one of the beautiful the beautiful benefits now of being at a small liberal arts institution. I mean, worst worst case scenario, we have a greater capacity to control the space. I mean, I can't imagine a, a school like UW Madison or you know, think of place place like Florida State. They try to reopen these places are small cities. You can't. You can't enforce any sort of social distance. You can't even you can't even right. pretend to police it, right? So um, you know that's why I'm really confident, right? I mean, plus we have we have a student body here. Everyone knows, right? When we say Beloitish, we know what we're talking about, right? And they're, you know, the students here they'll step up to the occasion. Um, so I'm not concerned about that. And I think um, I believe that there's a group of students that are working on a statement of culture that takes mm -hmm. into consideration the these types of issues. Um, so uh, I know that uh, uh, in emerging diseases, for example, we have done a simulation of body fluid exposure um, mm -hmm. using PPE and students have had the opportunity to see how easily it is to be exposed to, and this isn't even droplets, this is like vomit and blood type exposure. Um, and I can see, um, that this type of um, education and, and making sure practically that students know how to protect themselves and um, their colleagues is is absolutely necessary for um, for us to be able to um, be successful. Yeah, I think our, our campus really excels at community spirit and respect for one another. Yeah. Um, you know, stuff like uh, what what blew my mind coming here from a much larger campus when I first started teaching here was 
that geology puts out these experiments. Yeah. Like they put out these <laughs> simulations of like uh, that are these little wooden boxes that have rocks in them. And I'm like, oh my God, if you put these out on any campus I've ever taught at before, they would be just gone. Yeah. But but we can put this stuff out and say, please don't touch. And people don't touch them. I mean, I know they get, they do get knocked around a little bit. And I assume that that's mostly, you know, thoughtless, you know, people, um, you know, being clumsy or something. But, um, you know, I think Beloit is a place where if we can say, this is what we need to do to com- to save our community, right? Mm-hmm. To protect one another, I think people will will do it. And I also hear that we're getting uh, cool uh, cloth masks with bees on them, so. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. I mean, so I mean, there's- No, go ahead, Rachel, go ahead. I just wanted to say that there's a comment in the, the, um, the feed right now uh, about another mask uh, uh, design um, that might be possible for somebody with claustrophobia to to use it looks like it um has a little bit of a different like uh nose um space or something Mm -hmm. um i think that so um i i think that that's actually a really important thing for us to add i'm going to copy um and post a the cdc um uh instructions for making a cloth face covering that's going to be in the comments um brit where have you found some of your mask um patterns uh so there's a a good one from the new york times that uses uh shorter ties and then the one that i've been doing is the deaconess mask i think um and i can post links for that uh, for both of those two. Um, and I just want to uh, say if uh, there's somebody out there in the bullet community who's having trouble sourcing a mask or has a special request, you can hit me up uh, and you can, uh, you know, let me know if you've got any, um, any specific needs in terms of design. That's excellent. So um, what about people who uh, either can't uh, sew um, or don't have access to a sewing machine. Are there options that you've seen around for people in that case? Um, well, there's the t-shirt mask uh, where you kind of you cut up a t-shirt, and uh, oh. even some people I know who are pretty good at sewing have thought said that this is really slick um, and uh, works really well. And all you need are scissors. You don't need any special tools or training. Nice. Um, and yeah, I'll see if I can find a, a link for that one too. Mm. Great. Yeah, if you um, Google t-shirt mask, um, have you seen the the one that uses um, a bandana and like hair ties? Oh yeah, it's like just you just fold, you don't even have to cut or sew. Yeah, so if, you, if you're looking for different mask options, there's a lot out there. A good Google search can find you a lot of um, different types of, of um, ways to protect yourself. And, and remember that too, like the bandana, that's two layers of fabric over your mouth and nose um, that still protects you. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so Ron, Yo. let's shift gears a little bit. Yeah, yeah, I mean, so you know, I sort of want to go back a little bit to the initial, uh, I guess what you might call sort of information flip-flop, right? Um, that while I think, Brett, I think you had the right read on on why the WHO and the CDC were saying masks are ineffective. I mean, I think that language ended up being, uh, or the interpretation of it that way ended up being really problematic, right? Because I think it put out, it put out into the public this sort of mixed message that, oh, you know, these people are overreacting, people are overreacting with the masks, right? Mm. Um, because I think it is, it's a very nuanced approach to say, no, it's not that it's not that masks aren't effective. It's just that most of you aren't going to use them correctly, right? Or that the material that you need is a thing that is, you know, most masks aren't made out of, right? And most of the ones that you'd get a hold of are disposable. But I think that this is this is one of the reasons why it's so important. Um, you all know I'm a, I'm a public health person, right? And it's so important to focus on health literacy. Um, and if nothing else, I think this crisis has really underscored that. You know, you, we don't have the luxury of, of nuanced discussion around things, right? I mean, right. you gotta say, this is this and say it in plain language, right? 
right. Um, but as I think that's done, that's done a great deal of harm. And when I still go out and I, I see folks out at the store and at other places, when I go and do our family shopping, right? Um, so many folks, first of all, ignoring even the basic, the basic sort of recommendations that only one person from your family come once per week. I mean, I tell you right now, I walk out to Woodman's, and you, all you gotta do is just stand back and just watch like two or three people walk up and they'll look at each other and then they just walk in, right? Um, you know, that, so there's that. Um, but then there's just the other piece of it, which is, you know, they clearly, most of those same people aren't wearing masks and not even makeshift ones. And it's it sort of, you know, in my mind, it, since we live really in an age of what I have started to term the age of misinformation, yeah. uh, this, is, this is why this is a problem. Right? Why that flip-flopping was, or the seeming flip-flop was a problem. Um, but I also want to talk a little bit about, about the policy around this. And, you know, in an earlier episode, we talked about, um, about some of the other issues, particularly with respect to folks who are sort of criminalized, like particularly African-Americans in general and then African-American males in particular, and how um, there's a great deal of anxiety, right? Not claustrophobia, but other sorts of anxiety in wearing masks. Um, especially wearing them in public and, and, and wearing them at certain times in public, right? right. Um, but, but this is also one of those places where, you know, for me, policy is critically important, right? Having a policy that's in place and uh, one that people are expected to follow, but the enforcement becomes the issue. Um, and, you know, so I, I'll just stop there um, and say, well, so what, I mean, what are you all, what are your thoughts? as sort of people who are involved in mask around this idea of like how much, how much of mask and mask wearing should, be, should become like a policy, something that's a, a set policy until COVID is, is, is behind us. Right. Britt, go ahead. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm really looking forward to more studies on the effectiveness of masks in stopping the spread of COVID-19. And I think that that's gonna inform um, how, how stringent we wanna make requirements to wear masks and how um, what situations they would be required in. Because uh, I think if we could um, maybe get some more nuance on that, uh, it could, it'll help. Um, and, you know, I, 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 really, I really feel what Ron's saying about how um, difficult it is to communicate about science, especially science that's on the move. Um, and, you know, when you, when you want to explain why a thing is a thing, I often find myself doing this on like Facebook, right? Is I start explaining something to somebody and I realize I am constructing a really long chain of reasoning, right? <laughs> um, and it's not, you know, it's like, it's a lot to ask people to follow that. And it's a lot to ask science communicators to clearly communicate that all the time. So, um, but uh, I think the more that we can normalize face mask wearing, hopefully that will um, help. Uh, if it just becomes a normal thing, maybe then that means that uh, maybe uh, people whose uh, appearance or background is different won't draw suspicion um, when they have a mask on. Um, I'm hoping uh, that uh, it just becomes sort of a, it's just the thing that everybody does. and. Um, we do it out of politeness, not necessarily because there's somebody in the government telling us we have to, because, you know, you've seen the backlash. Uh, that's, that's been really uh, an issue that the government says so, and you don't want to do it because, you know, the government is telling you. <laughs> um, it's really yeah. counterproductive. Yeah, and, and we've also seen, you know, in, at least in Michigan, right, at least one, and I think this is the first that I've heard of, even internationally, the first time a, a fatality has been involved with respect to mask wearing. I don't know, Rachel, if you heard about that or not, but oh, I haven't yet. Yeah, so there was an incident. I guess what, maybe about three weeks, two or three weeks ago now, um, where a security guard who, you know, I, I mean, you you say, yeah, okay, maybe there's more to the story, but that's really not. I mean, there, is there really more to the story when a senseless murder is involved, really? Um, but the reality is, is that um, the guard told a person that they couldn't go in because they didn't have a mask. They got into a verbal altercation about that. And then that person returned with relatives and, you know, the guard ended up shot to death. Right. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, this is and but again, you know, it, at least ostensibly the the guard was just following the the guidelines. Right. I mean, it wasn't even a guideline at that point. Right. I mean, it was the, this is what our governor said. Right. Yeah. And this is how it has to be. Um, and so, you know, to me, this is one of the reasons why having clear, clear leadership is important, um, but, and clear guidance is, is important, but 
uh, I mean, I think Britt, you bring up this important issue, right? Is that there's still there still is this pushback, particularly in the U.S. context, that is that can't be they can't be dismissed, right? Um, people have have associated mask wearing and and being told to wear masks or being I should say asked or guided to wear masks. They've interpreted this as an unaccept some folks, right? Not everyone, as an unacceptable infringement on their freedom to be. Um, which is to me kind of extraordinary, right? Uh, but but sort of fits in with the American conceptualization of freedom, right? Which is the freedom to do what you want, not the freedom to be, to for everyone to be as they are, right? So um, anyway, it's fascinating, fascinating stuff. Well, and I think that Brit has a really, uh, I, I, Brit has a really interesting point too about the the normalization of mask wearing, right? It is it is still in the in the context of aside from you know whatever the government is 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 suggesting whatever the CDC is suggesting whatever epidemiologists and scientists are suggesting about the benefits of wearing masks it's weird um, it is weird to go out wearing a mask. Yeah. It feels weird. Um, it feels very weird. I've I've been to Ace Hardware a few times, and they've got like plastic uh, plexiglass in between the the um, uh, cashier and where you stand, right? And so I, I I'm really impressed with that. And I've been to Menards too, so you know they do the same sort of thing, right? Um, so they're thinking about these sort of um, uh, these sort of um, interactions and how we can do, how we can change them. But, but it is weird to be out wearing a mask. Um, I feel very self-conscious. How do you feel when you're out wearing a mask, Britt and Ron? Um, well, uh, it feel it does feel a little bit weird. Um, what I've noticed, uh, and maybe this is just people I've made masks for being nice, um, but people are really thrilled to get a mask that looks cool like that that um has you know like the origami pattern that i made uh the, the origami print that i made for uh ron uh i gave that to some japanese folks also who were like you know oh this is really cool um and uh the you know people said oh this is such a pretty print i really love it um so i think making if this is, this is sort of like what i feel like my my goofy little contribution to this is I have uh, friends who have made over 400 masks uh, and donated them to healthcare workers and oh, other, other folks who need them on the front line. Um, and, you know, and I've like made, I don't know, probably less than 50. Um, but what I'm trying to do is get people, get people a mask that they think is a little bit fun. Um, and that just sort of lessens the burden of wearing it. And, you know, you still look weird. I guess my social circle, we're all down with being weird. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm going to wear my Star Wars mask to the uh, grocery store. This, yeah, yeah. This is the one that I made for my spouse. That's a uh, link from link. Majora's mask. It's Link. So it's a Majora's mask mask. He's very excited about that. So I yeah. wish I could have popped over to Hong Kong and grabbed some of those Hello Kitty masks. That's what I wanted. I wanted yeah, that. yeah. Um, yeah, so just like, uh, you know, if people can have a little bit of fun with it or feel like they're pretty. Another person I made masks for, they were saying, well, these are the colors that I usually wear. So can you get me something that coordinates with, you know, and I'm like, wow, like that would never have occurred to me. I don't even care, um, you know. Uh, if they become a fashion accessory, uh, how, you know, it's all to the good, right? Yeah, I mean, so it is all to the good, right? Because as so I'll, you know, I'll, I want to talk about that first and then I'll tell you how I feel wearing them. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, one thing is that the tide may be turning. I think, Rachel, you just grabbed, um, grabbed something from Facebook, right? Where, and I saw this too, right? Is that there's a, um, about 60% of Americans believe masks should be worn in public. So maybe the tide really is turning in this direction, um, at least for now, and especially as long as we have COVID with us. Um, and you know, at the end of the day, public opinion is is what will guide us to sort of better mask etiquette and better usage, right? Um, but I, I started to see, <laughs> so I'm looking through Yahoo News and you know, I see the, the, the trikini, right? I don't know if you all saw this, right? So, so someone has produced a set of a bikini, right? I, or maybe it's a trikini. I don't know what you would call it, but, but it's a it's a bikini with a matching mask. Oh, nice! I, I thought, you know, yeah, that's how you do it, right? 
Um, and so maybe, maybe it is. I mean, your your um, your the request that you got isn't so far fetched as it were, right? Is that people are starting to say, well, "Look, I'm going to wear this. I need to look damn good wearing it, right?" That is what it is. So, um, and maybe that's part of how we get there. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I see you know, uh, Rachel. You brought up someone else from the chat, right? You wanted to say what they said here. Yeah, there's a, a comment in the chat. I've made Packers masks for friends whose husbands need to look manly. Um, yeah. And I think that that's actually another interesting point that, that I've seen repeatedly is that there's some, some feelings about masculinity that are wrapped up in wearing the mask. The, the idea of, I, I, I'm, that's not something that I necessarily understand, but I do remember that when um, Mike Pence uh, visited the Mayo Clinic, the Mayo Clinic had a, a rule about wearing a mask and he didn't wear, wear a mask. And there's this conversation about masculinity that was kind of wrapped up in that. And I'm interested in knowing a little bit about what you think about that, both of you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, now I'm probably not the best person to ask about uh, well, I mean, I guess in some ways I'm supposed to be the guy to ask since I teach <laughs> on men's health, but I, but I, but I'm not the best guy to ask about um, about those feelings from a personal standpoint, right? Because you know I worked through a lot of the more toxic stuff uh, when I was younger. Thank goodness, right? You know, my thank thankfully because of the mother I had, right? But um, I think that that I can see that, you know, I can see people wanting to. Um, especially some men feeling like you know putting a mask on is like admitting that you're weak like right that you that you that your body is weak um and the reality is that's not what coronavirus is about right i mean there are plenty of people unfortunately now um evidence suggests that the, or the cases suggest we have plenty of people who were seemingly strong right who also are now um either you know very very seriously ill or unfortunately deceased right so um, so I think that that's, that's part of it. I mean, I, when I go out in public, I mean, part of, part of what skews me on this is you all know, I lived in Japan for a very long time. And so, right. um, when I went there, um, as I lived there, it was, you know, when you got sick, man, you get a cold, right. And immediately it's like, you better put a mask on. And yeah. of course it was completely normalized, right. Cause you go to your office or you go to school and people, and you can always tell, oh, so-and-so has a cold, right. Cause they have a mask on. And so when you're dealing with, with that sort of cultural lens, for me, you know, I, the, what, the only reason I felt self-conscious, honestly, I felt self-conscious because I'm a kind of darker skinned black dude. Like, that's why I felt self-conscious when I went out. Like, I didn't feel self-conscious like, you know, man, I'm weak and, you know, this is, yeah. I know this coronavirus beat me. I didn't feel like that at all, right? It was more like I walked in the store and until, and this is the truth, until I looked around and saw some other people wearing the mask, I felt some trepidation, right? Um, but then I, when I looked and I saw a couple of other folks and I was like, okay, and then I went in. And that was for me, it was just a personal safety thing more than anything else. I didn't want someone thinking that I was gonna do something untoward, right? And that's, you know, that's sort of unique to the American experience here. And, um, yeah, I've noticed a lot of the rhetoric around mask wearing and um, strength uh, is, the attitude sort of seems to be, I'm going to take the hit by just getting sick. Yeah. Um, and that's my sacrifice that I'm making in this moment of pandemic. Uh, and the, the lack of, um, I don't know, what seems like overwhelming to me about this, um, the thing that's constantly on my mind is not that I would get sick, but that I would be making other people sick. And it, I just, I've, I had a couple of conversations where it was just so hard to communicate that that was my concern. Um, you know, I had a conversation with an old friend from high school and, um, and he said, you know, look, I've read everything that you, that you wrote and I understand it all and you don't have to worry about me. And I'm like, you haven't understood anything because I never once said, I'm worried about you getting sick. Okay. Everything I said was, I'm worried that you will spread this around to other people. You say you're strong enough and you're healthy and you'll you'll get sick and get over it. I don't have any reason not to believe you, but if you are sick and you're walking around with no protective equipment, you're going to get other people sick. Um, and that was kind of the end of the conversation. Like I don't know what he took away from it. Like if that if that point really got through, but so much of it is you know if you wear the mask, it's because you're afraid of getting sick. Whereas Ron pointed out in uh, other countries, it's you wear the mask to show consideration for other people and to prevent spreading the virus, you know, whatever you've got to other people. That's right. So we have to make that shift somehow. 
Well, then, you know, we may we may have that decision taken out of our hands if if it continues much longer, right? I mean, there's a when I saw that when we see those numbers, that 60 percent. I mean, I, I promise you, if you had asked that same that same question four months ago, people would have been like, no, you know, only 20 percent of Americans would say you should wear masks, right? You know, and they're all hypochondriacs, right? But now, I mean, I think as as it wears on, and we realize that that there are more more folks wanting to get back into something that they call normal. They're recognizing that 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 means there has to be some sacrifice. And let's just be perfectly frank here, right? Wearing a mask is a pretty small sacrifice. Um, I mean, like it, all things being equal. I mean, you think back to like the Black Plague, where right? okay, well, the sacrifice is we got to go burn all the bodies out in the street. Okay, you know, I'm left, or you know, so y'all got to take care of my kids. You don't have to take care of my kids. You don't have to do any of that. Just just put a cloth mask just on and wear the mask. You know, a yeah, I, on it, right? <laughs> That's yeah. it. I always say, if you're worried about the lockdown economy, let's talk about the ICUs, overwhelmed Whoa. people not being able to get on ventilators, digging mass graves economy, because. Yeah. That's the alternative, right? Well, and 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 even getting realer than that, having to having to make that decision economy, right? Like having to sit there and go, okay, well, so um, you know, your person here is on a ventilator and they're not gonna make it. So what are we gonna do? Right. What, what do you want to like? No, I don't want to be there at all. And more importantly, I don't want you to make me there. <laughs> I don't want you to do that to me. And I'm on and, and I'll make you a deal. I also won't do it to you. How's that, right? So it's it's interesting to think about this in the context of like vaccinations and our our country's approach to vaccinations and anti-vax uh, thinking um, where, you know, a lot of a lot of the way that we look at vaccinations as a, as a culture here in the United States is it's to protect me from diseases. Mm -hmm. It's to protect me from. So I get my flu shot so that I don't get the flu. And if I get the flu, it's it's a waste of my time to get that flu shot, right? And so there's an, and if I don't get the flu, then of course I didn't need the flu shot. You know, yeah. we we run into these these interesting thinking thoughts about how it's about our experience and just just us when in when we're thinking about public health, it's about um, it's about living in a community with other people and protecting one another through our own actions and, and through policies and regulations um, and things that, that protect more people than just one individual. Right. Um, and, and I think that that's, a, that's, another, um, that's another communication uh, issue that, that needs to be um, worked on through this. Um, how do we not only help people to understand the the rationale behind things but also to think collectively versus individually um yeah, yeah we're i mean look you know this is this is a conversation i have quite a bit um and then i want to get to the uh, the point that someone had here um from facebook as well is that you know the united states i think uh, we often forget right because we we have such generally speaking such short lives right mm -hmm. we often forget this country's really young like from a cultural standpoint, super young, and 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 given the the time it, uh, during which the country emerged, right, it it really sort of it's almost you imagine like a, a teenager becoming rich, right? right, having done some really awful stuff and like gotten super mad paid, and all of a sudden people are like, oh my god, wow, what, whoa, right, but but still a teenager actually, right? Um, when you think about uh, the U.S. and and from a cultural standpoint, I mean, look at the things that divide us still as a nation, right? I mean, it's like level one stuff, right? Um, you know, ooh, you look different. Like, really? <laughs> right? The ancient Egyptians all look different. <laughs> and that didn't matter, right? They all still look to the Pharaoh, right? But they had thousands of years to sort that out. Um, and the United States is still young as a nation. And, you know, hopefully events like this um, will will help to jumpstart and sort of push us forward, right? Um, so we start to realize that we do actually have a sort of common, not even a sort of, we have a a, a common goal uh, to protect and care for one another and our well-being. And you know that's 
that's one of the, the, the most beautiful things to come out of this awful catastrophe, right? Is, you know, the way that we have connected to one another. You know, I, we still do these calls and all of this stuff and, and we're meeting new people on the calls, right? Like, oh, these are my friends in Sacramento, right? And, you know, we're meeting these people like, oh, hey, you know, um, there's something about that that I think is, that defies, defies the, the containment feeling, right? And it says, you know, we can uh, still create connections with one another. But uh, before I go off even further on that, you know, this is a really interesting comment taking us about to, back to masks. So, um, one of our posters who's a trans man said, you know, me personally, I've, I've been uh, misgendered significantly more than I have without a mask. Um, it's very interesting to see, right? And so it's, it's also interesting how individuals assume gender pronouns, gender or pronouns based on the color design of the mask someone is wearing, right? So this sort of, you know, ties in in multiple ways to some of the comments, right? About the, the having to have a manly mask and that sort of thing. Um, yeah. so we think, I mean, what do people think I mean, is this a manly color? Is this a, I mean, is this a gender color? Like seriously, right? Are you like, does this convey anything to you or? Well, that's one of the more neutral prints that I've got in my inventory. Um, okay. I went, so um, like a lot of mask makers, I started off just by going through my stash of old fabric and scraps mm -hmm. from other projects that I've made. Uh, and most of that skews because this is sort of like the general market of fabric um, skews more feminine or juvenile. Um, mm -hmm. And that's, you know, cause I'm, you know, mentally I'm about a six-year-old um so uh so you know it's it, looking through that and thinking about making masks for adult men who are not nerds um was like I thought oh crap I have to get some different fabric so mm. I had to get online and buy some fabric that had kind of more of a neutral or masculine um kind of print on it um because you know if I send if I send this to a man uh you know I think a lot of guys just wouldn't wear it and then the then all of my labor has just been thrown away, right? Nice. Um, and they're less safe, right? So um, yeah, it's an issue, it's tricky. Um, I, was, I found it interesting. I went to Joanne Fabrics today to their, not to, not to, I didn't go to Joanne Fabrics, <laughs> not essential, um, but um, I went to their website today. And if you click on their, you know, shop for mask making supplies, all the fabrics that were coming up to the top of the page were um, sports, hunting, tractors nice. Cars, nice. Um, because I think that there's a big demand now you know mm -hmm. that people people making masks are saying I need more masculine fabrics for the um, the people in my life who want to to project that or present that right on yeah I mean this is it's not going to be it, we're not going to change like images and perception of, of masculinity and femininity we're not going to change that tomorrow right mm -hmm. but we'll still be safe right sorry rachel you were about to say something oh no i i was just going to say that i'm pretty picky about the the fabric that i want to wear i mean partially because i have yellow glasses and pig hair and you know can't <laughs> clash with that true, but true. I, yeah but i am really picky about that and so i i think it i think that seeing that that um people are making designer masks and and uh expressing personality through that is is really exciting for what it means for whether or not people are going to wear them so um we're about out of time and i wanted to just quick talk about um something that um uh uh we said that we were going to talk about fogging up glasses yes okay so number one, um, I suggest uh, in my masks, I've put in this like little channel of fabric. And in that channel of fabric, I have, this is literally from like electrical wire. It's copper that then I uh, can form to my nose. Mm -hmm. It decreases the, the amount of condensation that I've gotten coming out from the top. A second thing is um, I've heard this and I haven't tried it yet, but I'm going to. I'll report back in two weeks when we have our next Let's Talk Coronavirus. Mm -hmm. um, but rubbing a, a little film of soap on your glasses right um, and cleaning it, rubbing it in there can decrease the um, ability of the condensation to actually attach to your glasses. Um, but really uh, the first thing that I'd suggest is make sure you've got a good fit and a good seal around your nose. So. With that, um, I'm going to post in the comments on Facebook, um, as I'm tying on my mask, I'm gonna post a few things in the comments on Facebook. 
Number one is, I can't do this, sorry. Number <laughs> one is there was actually an interesting history of masks on an NPR podcast uh, called Throughline. Very, very interesting. Um, there's an article that they they link to as well. Um, and uh, I'll post both, the, both of those. Britt also has a, an interesting podcast about masks and uh, that I haven't listened to yet, but um, I'll be uh, listening to to that soon so um we have to go because ron has a class right after this so, i gotta go <laughs> so ron what are you doing this week what are you excited about this this 94th week of quarantine <laughs> yeah i mean the same things i've been excited about i think before um but i am committing myself to uh coming up with um, a couple of new uh recipes i'm definitely going to make banana bread with a twist this week Ooh, exciting. And Britt, what are you excited about? Um, oh, I'm not prepared for this question. Um, <laughs> I'm excited about the never ending slog of quarantine and yeah. spending all my days alone with my cats. Um, and uh, I'm making crepes for dinner tonight, so. Ooh, exciting. Um, well, and I yeah. I am past the point of no return in, in painting all of my cabinets. And so um, <laughs> I'm gonna continue working on that. So, um, Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we look forward to uh, seeing you again soon in two weeks. Yes. Thank you all, everyone. Take Thanks care. Thanks for having me, you guys. Of course. Thank you, Brent, for joining us.